Hello and welcome to week five. So this week we start to do some of the more exciting content in the course and that is uh, pull data out of a table. Last week we put data into a table and really um, that represents a hurdle for a lot of students because they have a hard time with the, getting the, the database set up, getting the connect scripts set up. So now that we've cleared that hurdle we get to start doing some of the more exciting things. Additionally, we get to start talking about another way of kind of just better organizing your code. So some cool tools this week. Uh, this lecture is going to be long, so I'm going to do my best to not ramble, but uh, it's going to happen. All right, so this week, the big things we're going to talk about are include require. That's a tool that you're going to start using on every assignment that you do. It's just it's just a tool. It helps you out. Uh, that allows us to do utilize information hiding, increase the security of our code and then retrieving data from a table. Last week we put things into a table, right? Insert. Now we're going to retrieve and display data. And so we're going to display data in a tabular format. Now the good news is I think you're all pretty confident or competent in your ability to create a table because we've done quite a bit of that already, right? You did the XO pattern, you did the checkerboard. Now this week we're going to move on to doing displaying more meaningful data in those tables. Same patterns, all that same stuff uh, definitely holds true here. So first thing that we'll talk about, it's a big one, is that I remember our connect scripts. So we didn't, ex when we did this, we did, we were just putting strings in here, username, password. Another way that you can do this is with variables and that's kind of what I've got going on here. Now one of the things I, I just touched on it last week and you've probably thought of it already, it seems really weird to write your username and password in plain text and literally just having that. You can imagine, I mean, how much of the programming we do in this class is going to be have a connect script in it. Probably almost everything. So your username and your password is going to be just sitting there in plain sight. Just to kind of recap what I mean by that, um, right, like this line. That line is going to be on the top of every page that you ever use to interface with a MySQL database or any database for that matter. That should just seem weird. How often do you write your username and password in plain text, right? You you don't. If it seems like a bad idea to have your, credential, your credentials in plain text at the top of every page, it is. And thankfully, using requires, uh, we can kind of fix that problem. The other problem with that is that that that, that password and username that's just sitting there, that's a publicly indexed folder. So uh, anyone, well, it's it's not quite as simple as that, but, but that stuff's kind of just sitting out there for people to view. So definitely not a good idea. So let's talk about some tools we have to fix that. We've got includes and we've got requires. I'm gonna talk about the difference real quick. Include is, uh, so, so your page is gonna be broken into multiple pieces and files. And include is more of a suggestion. It's like, hey, I'd like this file. If I can't find that file, then just continue with the rest of the page. A require is demanding the file. A require is, hey, I need this file. If I don't have this file, let's not go another another inch further with this process. I think we're gonna use requires in this class as, a, as opposed to includes. There's a time and a place for each. More often than not, requires the right tool. I mean, if you're expecting a file to be there that's not there, well, I don't really know how the rest of the process is going to proceed. So that's usually what you want to do. Um, so here's what the syntax looks like. So if you want to do an include, it's include, and then in quotes, the name of the file. Uh, if you want to do require, it's require, and then the name of the file in quotes. A lot of people have the wrong idea about this. A lot of people think of these as functions, and they call them as such, right, with parentheses. Now the interesting thing about that is that's just not entirely correct, but that's actually not wrong. You're not going to run into problems by putting parentheses around things. You can put parentheses around whatever you want. Just the question is, do you need them or not? So that's not necessary. It's just the name of the file. Now the other thing that's worth talking about is the file extension is not relevant. You don't have to require something that ends in PHP. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even have to have a file extension. And then it's also require once and include once. Now that's probably the better way of doing things, although I don't even, I don't do it that way more often than not because I'm just trying to keep things short and sweet. Um, it's hard for me to explain the difference, um, but if you write a lot of PHP, you will understand why this is necessary. At some point, you're gonna have so many requires, and sometimes your requires require other files, and so this ensures that the thing that you're requiring only gets included once because it's entirely possible you could write you know require 
head, require head, require head, and if you wrote that eight times, well then that file would get fetched eight times, and that's just wasteful. Um, require once is going to ensure that the file that you're requiring only gets fetched at a maximum of one time. So it's just a better function. You might be wondering, why, well, why would someone require the same file over and over again? Well, they wouldn't do it on purpose, but they might do it on accident. And this just kind of minimizes the, uh, the problems that might happen with that. So we've talked about it a lot um, in a minute here. Let me, let me just show you how to deal with your Connect script, and then we'll talk about how to improve things. So talking is one thing, in practice is another. So this right here, this is the uh, lab that we did in week four. There's my connect script, blah, blah, blah. We're not going back through all that. I just wanted to take an example of which is functional and show you what you can do with a connect script. So if this bothers you to have that at the top of every page, hint, it should, um, here's what you can do to fix it. You can take that line, you can cut it, create a new file, paste it, and head back to my old file and in, and then I say require uh, yeah I'm kind of doing this in a weird order really weird order uh, I'll call that connect dot PHP like that so save that and now this thing needs to call it be called connect dot PHP and so that's what a require does it, it means so when you when I say require in the name of a script it means hey that script is going to go right here it's just not written on the page anymore so it's a little bit more concise and now I'm not blasting my my username and password everywhere now my username and, and this connect line right here I will say I have a hundred different pages and they all connect to a database now this username and password is only in one spot as opposed to a hundred and that's just good so let me save this and let's see how it works uh, this is the page. I refresh it, and there's that. So that didn't go the way I hoped that it went. So the problem there was that if that if I want that to get treated like PHP, I need to wrap it in PHP tags. And now if I view the page, you'll see it behaves just like it made no difference, right? As far as the web server's concerned, as far as my browser's concerned, this right here is exactly the same as it was, but now my username and password's not sitting at the top of every page. Now the truth is, that's not great what I've done. It's an improvement, but we can improve it further, and I'll show you that in a minute here. Right, so at least now my pages aren't broadcasting my username and password. Me as a guy sitting here making videos that are going on the internet, I sure like that a lot better, but we can do better. All right, so another reason that you might want to use requires, I think uh, I like to use the analogy of uh, CSS. So those of you that develop have the background in web development or some experience in it, you know, you got a couple different ways to do CSS. One of them, one of them is the embedded sheets, which I always do, partly just because it's kind of easier. And another is linking to an external sheet. Now, the reason there's a couple reasons that you might ex link to an external style sheet. One of them is that you know you've got the same CSS rules that you want to apply to all the pages on your site. So why not just have one sheet and just link to it over and over again? The other benefit of that is that it makes your 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 page shorter. Right, like if you have 200 lines of CSS, why have those 200 lines, you know, sitting on every page? It just makes every page 200 lines longer. It's hard to look at. So those are reasons you might want to do that. You can utilize the same principles with a with a require script. So let me show you what I mean by that. So let's say you got a page that looks like this. This is PHP, which is absolutely specific to the page. I can't cut that out. But what you can do is realize that you know this stuff up here. Imagine if I had a website, right, with many pages. Well, all of the pages on that site would have the same head, everything between, everything from the doc type to the head tag might very well be exactly the same on every site on my, on my, uh, in my domain. So what you can do is you can cut that stuff. Uh, you can cut that stuff, create a new file, paste that stuff, save that as, uh, head.html head back to my other page and instead of having that chunk of stuff I can just say require head.html and I'll show you that it doesn't end up any different right so my script this big PHP script just got 24 lines shorter 
Sure, the organization of things is a little bit more complicated now, but I just want to show you that absolutely nothing's going to change and nothing changes. If I view the source, notice all that stuff that I just put in that, that that's all the stuff that was is now in my head. So notice that my web browser doesn't interpret that any differently. The key difference is that it's now my, my script is 24 lines shorter. And if you've done much web development, you've all seen the parts of a page where you might have hundreds of lines up in your head. And if you could reduce your code by hundreds of lines, that's just a lot easier for you to look at. Now, ultimately, this isn't going to result in any improved performance for your users, because as you saw, like your, your web browser doesn't interpret any differently, but it's sure a lot easier for me to look at. So it's common to take like the top part of your page, wick it out and call it this piece called head. And how about I take the bottom part, so everything from the footer down, cut that, create a new page, paste that, call this thing foot. HTML, head back to this page. So if I want to require that, I need to break into PHP, break out of PHP, and just do a simple require. Require foot.html, and I'll show you that the result is going to be exactly the same. I refresh, right, and there's my foot. And so all I've done here is I made, right, like I said, I made the organization of my page. I, I made like a single file into three files, which isn't so great. But now this big file, the one that I'm actually working on, got considerably shorter. Like I can't wick out this form, right? Because this, and, and another key idea here is reusability. Like that foot part, this is probably the same footer that's on every page. So rather than having to copy and paste that footer to every page, I can just write that require. And the big benefit here is, Let's say I make a mistake in my footer. I only have to fix it once. Right, if I want to add something like an exclamation point, I don't know why you'd want to do that. Now, let's say I had like 20 pages on my site. Now I just have to make the, the change in one place as opposed to making it in 20 places. So it's definitely a good idea in that regard. Not quite done talking about this yet. This is actually my second take on this lecture. This one's a little faster, which is hard to believe. So the last part of the discussion with requires is this. So there are some parts of your website that shouldn't be in the public domain. Let me show you what I mean by that. So here's my XAMPP, right? Flash drive, XAMPP, htdocs, week four. Let's recap some things. So here's the, the big XAMPP. So everything which I want to be on the internet, air quotes, is in this htdocs folder, right? Everything in htdocs is publicly accessible, more or less. And so I've been working out of htdocs. I've been working out of this folder called week four. There's that connect script. What I want to point out is that connect script is in the public domain. Everything inside of htdocs is in the public domain. So not so great to have you know sensitive information out there on a, all right, on a public folder uh, of a web server. So the last step of making this even better is securing it. So you really shouldn't have anything sensitive in the public domain. So what you should do is cut that thing. And I'll show you where you should put it. So if you go up one, you're in htdocs. This is still a public folder. If you go up one more, the only public folder is htdocs. So what you should do is uh, create a folder up above the public directory and sometimes people will call it require sometimes people will call it rec sometimes people will call it lib i'm going to call it lib which is short for library this is going to be a directory of files that should not be publicly accessible so i go into lib i paste that connect script and so now i've taken my connect script out of the public domain and i've moved it into a private folder right a non-publicly accessible folder and just showing you the whole process here's my flash drive here's xamp here's that lib folder Notice that lib folder is on the same, it's right above the contents of the htdocs folder. Now if I go into the htdocs folder and I look in week four, you notice my connect script's not there anymore. So that's just a great idea, right? That's one of the steps you can do to secure your connect script, make your site a little bit more secure. But I'm just gonna tell you that there's a little bit more to this than, uh, than what you're gonna like, but it makes sense. So the next little discussion we're gonna have is about uh, navigating directories and Linux. All I'm telling you is this, if you write dot dot forward slash, that means up one folder. Dot dot forward slash, dot dot forward slash, that would be up two folders. So that being said, let me show you some things. This is what I think you're gonna have the most trouble with this week. So remember this page that I was just working with a minute ago? And do you remember when I just pulled out, oh, I didn't pull out the, oh, all right, let me fight through my errors. 
So what I should do, okay, I got this connect script. So good, this is gonna do what I was, hope, was hoping it was gonna do. If I refresh this, it's gonna crash, right? That's what it looks like when the path to your connect file is not valid. So it's basically saying, hey, your require failed. So that's on me. So here's what I need to do. So when you do a require, you need to understand that the require is always relative to the current directory. In other words, when I write just the word require, that means, hey, look in the folder that I that this file is saved in, you can see it right there, for something called connect, right? There is nothing called connect there. So what I have to do now is figure out the path from this folder to the connect folder. So here I am. I like to look at it using that little view. So I need to go up one to htdocs, up two to xamp, and then down one into lib, right? So up one is that folder, up another is that folder, and then I need to go down into the lib folder. So that's gonna be up one, up two, down into lib. That's the path to my connect script. So I think a lot of the hardships that you're gonna experience this week are gonna be related to just getting connected up to your uh, connect scripts. Now I'm just gonna say this, I don't really know how to enforce it. If we were in class, I could make this more clear, but make sure that your remote web host, like the real online host, make sure that you have the same relative folder names and paths because you don't want to create you don't want to have a different path locally as you do on your web host right so if for me for example you see how i'm working if everything i'm doing is out of a week four folder then make sure that you're working out of a week four folder on your web host because it gets really painful when you've got different paths let me save this let's see if it works i'm never shocked if it doesn't work it's easy to mess up the paths and i got my path right and you see that footer's happening. So that is everything we're gonna talk about with requires. Well, I just kind of jumped the gun on some things. So another, right, so I was talking about securing your connect script. The other thing I did was this head and the, and the foot. Remember when I took those out and I created some file called head and I created a file called foot. There are some limitations with what I did. We can improve those things if that's something that we wanna do. It just it helps to shorten up your code a lot. All right, so now the next part of the lecture is related to querying a SQL table. So if you don't have database experience, this might sound like it's gonna be scary, but it's not scary. Um, like I said, it, it's a suggested prerequisite for this class, but if you don't know the first thing about SQL, it's really not a problem. I'm gonna show you, spoon feed you all the SQL that you ever need. SQL can be complicated, but we're not gonna make it complicated in this class because it doesn't need to be. So this is what the syntax looks for pulling something out of a table. So keyword select, something is the name of the field that you want to return from, and then the name of the table that you want to search, and then where, this is used to restrict the information. So like where, I don't know, age is greater than 10, or where name equals Ken, something like that. And then there's this kind of weird question I'm posing, what would this return? So if we query a table using PHP, what do we get back? Well, the kind of long story is you get back this weird thing called a resource, and it's kind of a lot like an array. Now, I didn't, I don't do a lot with arrays in this class. And we use them here and there a little bit. I try and abstract as much as I can, but an array is basically a single variable which stores a bunch of stuff or nothing. This next slide is going to be intimidating, but I'm going to show you some code for it. Oh, not this one, but the next one. All right, so let's just say that you are new to the select statement and right, you don't know a lot of SQL. So let's say I've got a table called zoo, I've got a primary key called ZID, species, name, height, weight. Those are the fields in the table. To show you what that looks like, uh, here's the table. Not that, no, table, 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 this table. All right, it's called zoo. It's in the cheese ball table, zoo ID, species, name, height, Wait, that's what's in it. It's not a huge table. Imagine if you had a table with thousands or millions of rows. Not inconceivable at all. So let's say I wanted to query that table to find the species of every animal. Well, the SQL would look like select species, so the thing I'm looking for, from zoo. Notice there's no restrictions here. It's not like every cheetah or lion or ostrich or something like that. So if there's no restriction, if you just want everything, well, then there's no where clause. And sometimes that's the case, usually not. Also notice the caps. So I'm trying to be consistent about this, but I'm not always. Uh, so all caps is a keyword. So like from, for example, should be uppercase. Just trying to help you differentiate the SQL from the fields. All right. So 
return the height of every line. So that's going to be select height, right? The thing you want, name of the table from zoo, where species equals lion. Notice the back ticks around the value. That's what a kind of a normal query looks like. Let's say I want to return the species and weight of every animal. So multiple things I want to return. So it's going to be select species comma weight from zoo, right? No where clause here because it's every animal. And if I just want to return everything, which is actually a lot more common than you might think it is, that's just going to be select star from zoo. So star is a wild card. That means everything. It's actually pretty common to do a select star from something. So only these one of these had a where clause. If you're thinking this is complicated, you're probably overthinking it because it's it's just not, right? So select the thing you want, it can be everything. From is just gonna be, you need to tell it what table you're querying, and the where is usually pretty straightforward, something like that. I'm always happy to help. If you're having a hard time writing a SQL query, then just send me an email, I'll, I'll write it for you. It's not real complicated. Debugging your PHP, that could be complicated, but uh, writing a SQL query is probably not too complicated. Let me show you another tool, just especially if you're new to this. One thing you can do is if you got a table, I just created this table by hand, but if you wanna practice your SQL, you can click on that SQL tab and just practice writing some queries. Like let's say I wanna find the weight, I don't know, how about everything about every lion? So I'd go, I won't, I won't make it case sensitive. Select, um, star from zoo uh, I can't make up my mind whether I want to do caps where a uh, species equals lion and this is case sensitive potentially I press go and that's everything about every lion so if you just want to practice writing some simple queries then I suggest that you could just create a silly little table and just practice writing some SQL it's not uh, it can be super complicated. I mean, we could probably spend a whole year learning SQL, but uh, more often than not, you don't need to get that fine with it, especially in the world of PHP, because PHP has some cool tools that we can use. All right, so that's SQL. Now, this is the scary slide. Now, it's scary, but I'm telling you, this is it. I'm, I'm seriously, this is week five. There's five more weeks. I can't think of any other tools that you're going to need. This is all of them, right? And and I know sometimes I do this, I create these slides, which looks kind of scary. But my point is, yeah, this looks kind of scary, but that's it. If you, At the point where you can apply everything on this slide, well, then you can do pretty much whatever you want with a SQL uh, result. So this is what our general query looks like. So some variable, call it whatever you want. I usually call it SQL, right? That looks a lot like last week, right? Last week we did inserts, now we're doing selects. You can probably appreciate it if this is new to you that select is easier than insert. It's just not all the values and such. This is what it looks like when you actually want to process a query. Last week I called my thing DBC. It doesn't matter what you call it. This is literally the same stuff as we did last week. It's just a different SQL query. Now here's the here's the PHP tools. So this function right here, MySQLI underscore num underscore rows. So if you call that function, oh, I have no idea what I did. If you call that function on that thing, it will tell you how many rows you got from your search. Because sometimes you do a search and you get zero rows, maybe you get a million rows. If you need to know how many results you got, then that is a good tool for you. You can live your whole life without ever using this function, but sometimes it's a good way, a good tool to help you solve a problem. Now this is the more complicated one and it looks scary, but this is the good news is we're gonna get a ton of practice with this one by the time it's all said and done. So MySQLI underscore fetch underscore array. The result, if you call that function on the thing that you get from your query, that will grab the rows from your, so that'll grab, that'll grab the first row from your result. And it's kind of an interesting function because let's say you got 10, let's, let's say your query resulted in 10 rows if you call this, it'll fetch the first row. If you call it again, it'll fetch the second row. If you call it again, it'll fetch the third row. So it's capable of kind of keeping track where it is with your data set, which is, which is pretty cool. There's also fetch all and fetch ASOC. There'll be times when we'll use all of these things, but like I, when I say there are alternatives, you just, you just switch that. Like uh, array can be switched with all and ASOC depending on what you want to do with it. Now this right here is just kind of a syntax. Notice this is just that same function which I talked about a minute ago. This is the syntax that I'm gonna use to, to fetch a row from the results. So a variable, call it whatever you wanna call it. I always call it row. I don't know what else you would wanna call it. And I set that equal to a call to that function. Like remember I said this gives you a row at a time. So every time you call, every time you write that, 
it'll give you a row, semicolon. And this right here, that's going to be a hard one to kind of make clear, but that's, uh, that's what you use to pick out a field from your results. There's no way for me to really illustrate that without doing it. Now the last thing I want to show you before I actually get into the real examples is this. So these are some output tools in PHP. You're familiar with Echo. Echo is what you use to send output to the browser. Print R is what you use to display the contents of an array. You might be wondering why the heck would you ever need to do that? Well, I promise you, you can't echo an array. So if you want to display an array, that's a useful function. If you have something that you just that you want to display every possible bit of information about it, then var dumps the thing. So those are both functions. So now let me get into a real example. I'm out of a sling now. I can't type very well, but uh, but now I can do some examples for you. So let's let's get real here. So here is some code. All right. So here I am, a pretty simple script. So I've got a require. Notice it feels nice now that when I, when I want to connect to my database, I don't have to write my username and password, right? For a guy making videos on the internet, I greatly appreciate not having to worry about that now. So here's what some SQL looks like. So select star from zoo where species equals lion. That's literally the same thing that I wrote a minute ago at the console. So that's going to give me every information about the lions in that table. And this right here is the same, this is literally exactly the same line as we wrote last week. So result, so I want to save the result as something called result and my SQL query, name of the database connection, there's my SQL or die and spit out the query. Let me show you what this looks like. It's not interesting at all. I don't think it is at least. All right, so did I, were there any lions in the table? Were there not any lions in the table? Now, hopefully last week you learned that just seeing no error messages at all means it probably is working, but let's try and interpret these results. So I want to figure out how many th things were in there. So if I go like echo result, now that's not a string and you're going to see that. You can't echo it out. Now you don't need to care about that. Oh, oh yeah, this is very misleading. Uh, I don't even have local host up here. So the some of my conclusions were false thus far. All right, so class MySQL result could not be converted to string. All right, so this is where those like print R comes in. So you can't do an echo on something that's not a string. So I can try and do like a print underscore R. We'll see how that goes. This is gonna be weird. This I don't even know if I should show this to you. I debated whether I should even bring this up this week. So when you try and print it out, you get some weird array. And it's like current field, zero, field count, five, num rows, two. So what that's kind of sort of telling you, you shouldn't worry about this. But there were two lions. Remember how I did select star? So each one of them had five fields, and there were two rows. If you don't want to look at that, good, don't look at it. You could also do a var dump on that. All right, so all of this is a pretty convoluted way of showing you the utility of the thing that I was trying to show you, which was uh, this MySQLi fetch array. So like the result that you get, you can't do anything with it. It's just, it just is this thing that you could spit out some information about it. So what you really need to do with it to get anything useful out of it is create a variable called row and call that other function. So MySQLi, fetch and so you got choices right you can do fetch all fetch a sock i'll do uh fetch a sock because i actually like that one the best it doesn't really it really uh doesn't matter a whole lot and so that is a basically remember this picks out a row from the result and it saves it as a row and now row is also an array so that is something i could try to echo or you could just trust me that it won't work and so I'll do print underscore R of the row and that'll maybe shed some light on what's happening here so I save that I refresh and so you see the ZID is 3 species lion name Simba height 120 so that's the first matching row and I'll show you what that corresponds to in the actual database right so ZID lion Simba 120 and if I do another call to that and print it out I'll get this lion named Sally um, so just for fun I guess if I did uh, I'm just this is pretty 
lazy. But if I did that, so get a row, print it, get a row, print it. I'll show you what that looks like. So it's going to give me the information about both of the lions. And I didn't do a line break, so it's pretty hard to look at. But there's Simba and there's Sally. So you, at this point, maybe it's coming together. And it, and from here forward, it's just going to be a, a matter of, of a kind of tying it all together. And so I'm going to go through a bigger example, which is going to comprise the rest of the lecture. And I think it's going to help everything to make sense. But let me just kind of spam through a couple slides here real quick. So at this point, I've kind of demonstrated all of these things, except MySQL num rows. Um, all right, so here's the recipe for outputting data from a table. Right, so this is going to be this is going to look like a stretch, but like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an example with this one. So this looks weird. People always have a hard time digesting it. So while loops, right? We've talked about while loops before. So this little condition right here should throw you for a loop. I mean, because it just doesn't seem like the right kind of thing. Normally, when we've got a like a while loop, our condition is has like an inequality in it, right? An equal, like two equal signs or a less than or a greater than. This right here is saying, hey, there's a variable called row, and this is literally an assignment statement. So I've got this variable called row, and I'm assigning it the result of whatever MySQLi fetch array gives me back, or fetch ASOC or fetch all, right? There's, they're different things. I'll show you what they are in a second here. Um, so that looks like the kind of thing which might, like how does that work for a while loop? Well, it's an assignment statement and how it works is, remember every time you call this, it grabs a row. If there are more, if there's a row to fetch, then it'll set this thing to the contents of that row. This will evaluate to true and it'll do a, an iteration through the loop. Let's say you have uh, 10 results that got fetched. Well, for the first 10 times, this would evaluate to true. And at the point where this doesn't return any more rows, then this whole thing evaluates to false and it just bows out of the loop. So this is a really cool uh, technique for displaying the, the data. So let me show you a couple things before I do that. A minute ago, let me do an echo, a line break, just to make this look less hideous. Let me show you the difference. Uh, so that's fetch ASOC. Let me show you the difference, fetch array. Just, just show you how those things are different. You don't have to care much, but I'll show you. Oops, I did something bad on line 13. Oh, forgot the word, the letter O. Yeah, that's a problem. So I refresh. So fetch ASOC does that, and fetch array does that. So notice that ASOC's a little more concise. So for ASOC, it's like ZID is three, species is lion, name is Simba, height is 120, weight is 600. For fetch array, it does this kind of weird thing. So it's like zero is seven, ZID is seven, one is lion, species is lion, two is Sally, name is Sally. You see how it's, it's redundant, right? It's everything you get from this one, along with this other kind of uh, indexed array. I think the best way to understand that is, let me show you what fetch, fetch all does, right? Remember I said there was three ways you could do this. If you do fetch all, you will get a result like that. So fetch all just does this. This is what's called an indexed array. Notice the fields are just numeric, kind of arbitrarily. The first one's zero, the second one's one, right? And they just kind of go like that. Yeah, I don't think you want to use that one, probably, because it's just kind of a little bit harder to work with. So either do fetch array, which is going to give you kind of excessive information, or do fetch ASOC, which is going to give you probably what you want. So fetch ASOC, I think, is probably the best choice for what we're using it for. Although I don't, I don't really care what one you use. It's just, just understand that fetch uh, array gives you more stuff than you're actually going to use. So, anyways, let's uh, let me show you that trick that I was showing you a minute ago. So the loop issue. So uh, I'm not going to write this whole thing by hand because this video is already long. So I'm going to do a little bit of kind of like pause, time lapse. So I'm going to show you how to output the rows. Um, as a uh, as a table, I'm going to work towards it. So what I want to do is see this magical line right here. This get a row. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write a while loop, and then I open a parenthesis and I close the parenthesis around it. Right. So that that process of fetching a row, I'm just going to make that the condition on my while loop. That is the process for iterating through a set of results. Right? If there's nothing in your results, then this doesn't happen at all. If there's 10 rows that get returned, then you're going to get 10 trips through the loop. And so from here, 
that doesn't do a lot of good. So what I'm going to do is uh, pause it and start translating this into a table. So do you remember the process for a table? We had a loop and outside of the loop, more or less, I mean, this is ugly, but that's just the way it's going to be today. Table uh, border equals one. Do you remember how we kind of started the table outside of the loop and then we closed the table outside of the loop? Yeah, have still typing problems. Remember that little story? And then we had like the whole nested loop kind of thing going on. Well, this isn't going to be a nested loop. It's, you know, I, a minute ago I said I was going to do the time lapse pause thing, but I don't really think I need to. So before and after the loop, we're going to open and close the table tags. Now, the first thing that we're going to do when we go into each iteration through the loop is uh, echo out a uh, table row tag. And the last thing we're going to do in each iteration is echo out a closing table row tag. And then the middle part is going to be spitting out the individual contents that we want to spit out. So let's say that we want to display the information about these lions, well, or whatever the heck is part of our search. So let's head back to uh, our table here and make an arbitrary decision about what we want to spit out. I don't think you want to display the ZID. Nobody cares what the ID of the lion is, but maybe they want to know the species and the name, right? Let's just say those are the two things we want to display. So this is going to be kind of a tough part. So what I want to do is I want to spit out each of those things. So that means that my each row is going to have two TDs. I think that's a fair thing to say. So I'll say echo, let's open up a TD and I'm going to close, oh, I forgot my quotes, open up a TD close a TD, um, open a TD, close a TD. You see how I like to shell things out? So what I've created here is kind of just like a basic structure and then I'm gonna stitch in the variables in a second here. So here's the best way to do this. Um, so I'm, I said I was gonna do names and species. So this first one, if I want, if I want to get the name, here's where this comes into play and this is kind of difficult. So I'm gonna say, row and in square brackets the name of the field I want is name that's more or less how this works this is this is what I was trying to get at from this slide back here so you don't want to display necessarily everything only the stuff you want to display is what you're gonna put in those square brackets here and this other part is gonna be row and the thing you want to spit out is I think it was called species now the part that might gonna be standing out to you is this is gonna be hard to read. So I think a good idea would be to kind of create like a header row. That header row is also gonna be outside of the, right, there's only gonna be one header row. So I'm just gonna do a big old ugly TR and set of TDs up here. It's hard to keep track of these things. So that's gonna be name and that's gonna be species. So, right, there's only gonna be one set of opening and closing table tags. I did something egregious somewhere. There it is. Um, and so there's the opening and closing table tag. And this is just my header row, right? Because people want labels. This isn't gonna work great. So don't get too excited about it. Sorry, I didn't do any time lapse, but I kind of realized I probably didn't need to. And you get this old classic error. So here's the problem. It's a complicated one to explain. So basically, you know when I said this is the name of the animal and that's the species of the animal? Um, you're not allowed to, uh, you can't address an array in an echo is more or less what it is. So there's two ways you can deal with it. I'm gonna show you both approaches. One is just realize that you're gonna have to do some concat concatenation. So you can break the string, concatenate, and head over here, concatenate, and re-get the string going. You see how I had to do that? So you're not allowed to spit out like an array field inside of an echo. And so you can you can do that and break it up and concatenate it. And I'll show you this is going to work a little bit better. Uh, not good enough. The other approach, which is better, I think, I'm going to get rid of that concatenation is if you want to, if you need to index into an array, you can wrap it in curly braces. That does the same thing. So if you just take that array operation and wrap it in curly braces, that's a lot easier than concatenating. So I save that, I refresh, and now I get uh, a hideous looking ridiculous table, but it kind of sort of worked. I'm not exactly sure what I did wrong, but uh, we'll figure it out in a minute here. Um, that's just not valid. It kind of looks like I have three 
TDs in the heading column and only two TDs down on the table. What did I do? Oh, you see what I did is I, I didn't close that TD tag appropriately. So I had open close, open close, and I think we're gonna be in a lot better shape now. If I refresh, now I have a table. So Simba's a lion, Sally's a lion. So that's the process of spitting out your results into a table. You have created dynamic tables before, and I hope you appreciate that when you did like the whole nested loop thing, the checkerboard thing, that was actually a lot more difficult of a table structure than what this is right here. So just recapping, right? It was clunky when I had to put it together for you, especially when I'm trying to do it in the shortest amount of time possible. But basically the recipe is, Outside of your loop, open your table. Outside of your loop, close your table. And then before you get into the loop, just spit out the headings. Now, just let me go back to this, see if there's some points I missed. I'm sure there are, right? So here's that deal. Um, all right, so we've used repetitive repetition structures in the past to create tables, so it's kind of just that same thing. Now, the uh, last thing we'll talk about is search results, and that's the part I'm going to have to kind of just write, and then we'll come back to it, and I'll explain it. And also, what if the search comes up empty? So I'm going to pause this, and I'm going to add a little bit to my example, and then we'll talk about kind of the closing example for the week. All right, so all I did, I'm just going to do this kind of one step at a time. I created a simple um, form on the page, right? Its action is this page method is get it's just got a field where you can search for animal like so you can type in lion and it'll display all the lions you can type in monkey and it'll display all the monkeys if you type in turtle i don't think there are any turtles so i don't know what it'll do we'll talk about that in a minute so that's the thing i added first so the next step is i need to get the information from the search so i'll do that all right so all i added is i went in here and i put a little if block so an is set so i said uh if someone submitted some information about an animal, then get that animal. Now the other part, which I understand, because I've been down this road before, is you know this whole like query and drawing the table? Well, that should only happen if someone searched for something. So it's probably a reasonable-ish idea to cut that and stuff it inside of this, this if block tabbing it out just to make it look better, right? Because it doesn't make sense to carry out a search or display the results if if no one searched at all. And so the change I need to make is, you know, instead of searching for lions every time, I need to search for the animal value. Not the animal, that actually sounds okay, but it's not right. And that's, that's, that's the only change I had to make. So I had this static search, which was just do lions every time. So all I did is put a simple little form on there and I got the results from the form. Instead of just doing the static search, now I search for whatever the heck they entered, and I spit out the table here. So let's show you what that looks like. So I refresh, eh, of course, line five. Um, oh, I forgot to close my square bracket. Hard to close your square braces. I make mistakes on my is set line all the time. All right, so there's no table. If I put in the word lion, Right, there's no table because so there's no table because the table comes from this is set which I wasn't passing, but now that you actually search for an animal, you get the table. Uh, the kind of interesting part is what if you do a you know you search for one of those, well you get this weird table right when that probably shouldn't really happen. So that's the last point I had in the PowerPoint. What if there's no results? So what if there's no results? So what can we do about that? So basically this table shouldn't get drawn unless this thing returns more than one row so what you could do is something like this you could say if my sqli num rows um, is greater than zero then do this uh, tabbing it out otherwise say uh, yeah, echo no matching rows, something like that. Killing my white space because it's just getting all spread out. Now if I save this, head back to my page, right? I searched for whatever the heck I searched for. All right, I messed up on line 12. Oh, oops, you can't just write that. You got to, it's a function and you need to pass it the result. Uh, result, and now that should do what I hope it does. 
No matching rows. And if I put in a lion, I get lions. If I put in a giraffe, hoping I spelled it right, I get Tony the giraffe. And I put in a, a Ken, and I get a no matching rows. This is a good example of where you definitely would want your uh, your like processing to be on the same page as your as your form, because you might want to want to keep querying, keep querying, keep querying. So kind of interesting week. I mean, this is almost an hour long lecture. Uh, there's some really cool stuff that happens this week, and and it's it's probably not the easiest. I don't know. For me, I worry that I'm going to have a hard time conveying to you how little new information we learned this week. But but this is a week where we really start tying things together. So it might seem kind of intimidating. But really, we only learned a handful of new tricks. We learned requires. And requires aren't really a game changer, right? It's just changing the structure of our code. It's really just try. It's really literally just a tool to make your what you're doing more secure, making your pages easier to manage. Sure, there might be some hiccups and some growing pains as so you start implementing those in your code. But ultimately, they're not meant to make your life more difficult and we learned a new query and we learned some tools for processing those queries but more than anything this is just finally getting a chance to start doing some some useful output with the information that we've learned so it's pretty exciting in the big picture if you have any issues I really really I'm trying to recommend that you come in on a Friday I could probably help you troubleshoot your code pretty quickly or help you to go through some new examples if that's what you want um, yeah, do, do remember, this is the first time I've ever taught this class online, so translating all of everything we do into these into these YouTube videos, I mean, I try and do the best I can, but I, I worry every week that I'm not getting enough examples or that I'm not having a thorough enough discussion about the content. So if there's things where I'm coming up short, um, right, those Friday sessions are completely meant to fill those gaps. I find it hard to believe that I'm actually, you know, covering everything thoroughly. I'm trying, but... Uh, if there's some extra help that you need or even just some feedback for me, then let me know. I just say that because I just talked for 45 minutes and I hope I did a pretty good job of covering everything, but I'm not sure. So feedback is appreciated. So hopefully this helps and uh, hopefully you, under, you can kind of see it coming together. We're getting to the pretty exciting parts of the course. So thanks for watching.